Our next speaker is uh, Dr. John Paul. Uh, he was uh, conducting the workshop yesterday. But for those of you that don't, don't know, I will tell very briefly uh, his uh, short CV. Dr. Paul is an eminent authority on North American Indian civilizations and has directed numerous archaeological excavations and surveys in Canada, the United States, Mexico, and Central America, as well as Europe. He has designed many exhibitions on North and Central American Indian peoples, including the Aztec Pantheon and the Art of Empire at the Getty Villa in 2010, and co-curated the exhibit The Children of the Plume Serpent, The Legacy of Quetzalcoatl in Ancient Mexico at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Dr. Paul is noted for bringing the ancient past to life using a wide variety of inno in innovative techniques, and his experiences have taken him from the Walt Disney Imagineering Department of Cultural Affairs to CBS Television, where he served as writer and producer for the American Indian documentary series 500 Nations. Uh, and Princeton University, where he was appointed as the first Peter J. Sharp curator and lecturer in the art of the ancient Americas. We welcome Dr. Paul. Thank you, Thank you very much for having me. Uh, this is a, 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 a really rare opportunity. It was something I proposed to the Art History Students Association in Manuel last year. And, uh, Patty very graciously uh, accepted to uh, participate in this, so this is really exciting. And I'm also very happy that these speakers were so motivated. I was especially pleased with Elizabeth Boone's presentation and, and so many of the others uh, uh, that we wanted to stick to this theme of costume, especially this afternoon. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, my participation in this and the effect that Patty's work had uh, directly on my uh, my research, as well as my participation in bringing the ancient past to life. Um, let's see, how do I... Okay. Uh, you're all familiar, of course, with the four-volume set uh, that Patty uh, uh, created in co collaboration with uh, Francis Berdan. Um, we were all very impressed, though. This is the work that I knew that Patty was doing as her dissertation at uh, UCLA, Indian Clothing Before Cortez. Uh, incredible as it seems, um, Many of us, well, in fact, the entire field was a little mystified as to how to identify men and women in the codices. So um, it seemed at first as if this, and I know her dissertation committee seemed thought this was a bit of a, a kind of a, a very basic or practical approach in anthropology. Uh, but when she created these diagrams and broke all of this material down uh, through its representation and these pictographs, it suddenly became apparent that this was a world that we were in fact looking at all the time throughout all of these villages that we were working in Mexico, uh, and that this was this was we were we were staring and working with the um, Mixtec women up in the Mixtec altar wearing all of these capes and long skirts and things. These these were the people of the codices, so that was a, a major revelation. Um, for me, it was uh, Patty's work uh, both with Codex Mendoza and also with um, uh, uh, the uh, clothing before Cortez that uh, was part of my, what drew me to Los Angeles in the first place. I had an opportunity to go to grad school uh, on the East Coast. I was accepting University of Michigan, but I was a, a not an interdisciplinary education with uh, along with, uh, uh, you know, at, at Hampshire College. I, I, I went for the archaeology program here at UCLA, and everybody thought that was a little peculiar, but uh, this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to be able to participate in film production as well. and. Uh, I came, when I came to Los Angeles, I searched out uh, the early costume designers. Uh, I met Edith Head. I talked to uh, the one person I became friends with was uh, Vittorio Nino Novarese, who had had all the Academy Awards for Cromwell, Agony in the Ecstasy, Spartacus, things of this nature. And, uh, and it is still my ambition to uh, create uh, these, these films and bring these films to the screen. Um, but uh, it was through uh, an understanding of ritual dress, the biggest impediment to bringing the ancient past of pre-Columbian America to the screen is what did they look like? Uh, Hollywood still thinks they look, and you saw how many 
uh, corrupted images we still have, that still persist in Elizabeth Boons' talk about our interpretation of the Aztec past. So with uh, Patty's groundbreaking research and getting us to understand what these things actually were, it was Nino Novarese when I asked him, why, did you become an why didn't you become an archaeologist? Why did you become a costume designer? And he said it was the only place that would pay me to experiment with what I couldn't dig up as an archaeologist. <laughs> So that took that as a mission between Patty and Dino Novarese. That's what got me into this business. Now, um, my initial, I thought initially that I'd like to work with a National Geographic artist and bring these things to life. Patty had had this opportunity with this magnificent painting of the encounter of Montecuzoma and uh, uh, Cortez. But that didn't quite work out. So I turned to a hobbyist series, this Osprey series of military costume books. And um, I had no idea what kind of an effect I was going to have, but you're all familiar now, of course, with these images. They're circulated widely on the internet. Uh, but this wouldn't be possible without Patty's analysis. Uh, for the first time, we were able to kind of bring, I, was, I felt that I was able, working with a, a very good artist, Angus McBride, uh, to bring all of these ancient people to life. Uh, and to really begin to understand what these would be like. As my colleague Simon Martin says, who's also an, a, originally a graphic designer, uh, well, John, I, and the frustration we have of trying to get Hollywood to pay attention to this, uh, well, John, what we're doing is content. So uh, this is what I'm working on in Hollywood. I'm doing content uh, before the film starts. Yeah. Um, but it's extended. I mean, this is, um, I was very, uh, Danny Zaborover and I were in uh, the Museo Templo Mayor two summers ago, and they had an exhibition on warfare in the Aztec world, and they had created this uh, Tlacoch uh, Calcat that uh, Susan had talked about, and we were kind of astounded by it. And then uh, one of the, a couple of the people in the gallery said, well, John Pohl is here, and they came out and wanted to meet us, and uh, and wanted, wanted me to kind of do a kind of size up there, uh, Tla Coach Kalkat, right there on the spot. And I foolishly kind of said, well, I, I, I wasn't sure that the uh, Macquawi was quite that short. And I finally kind of got wise to it, just shut up and said, it's magnificent. And it really was. I mean, <laughs> this, this is, I mean, this is exactly what we think of, a, of as a, a terrifying commander on a battlefield. It was, and it was a huge hit at the Temple Mayor. So uh, another effect of this, though, was what I got from uh, Vittorio Nino Novarese, and that was this idea of constantly working back and forth with using popular entertainment as a way as a kind of laboratory, uh, particularly History Channel, Discovery Channel projects, to then ask new questions of what was going on in the past. And this is, uh, you're aware of what I've been able to investigate with the idea of ritual warfare, or bringing, home the pa uh, bringing war back home. Um, so this, uh, all of this wealth that supply, was supplied to the uh, Aztec Empire was predicated on, I have argued, another, another group's system. Uh, this is not Aztec wealth, per se. Uh, it is, uh, however, a wealth system. Uh, we uh, focus, tend to focus in the late post-classic on gold, on turquoise, on cacao, on these uh, magnificent feather ornaments, and especially on textiles, as you know from my presentation, uh, the textiles were, were one of the most highly valued, uh, and even a form of a kind of a, a monetary form. So all of this warfare, all of this uh, uh, pageantry, Patty once wrote a very famous article on what price uh, glory uh, in Aztec uh, uh, warfare, um, was really predicated on, now this was where our another UCLA person that we've all talked about today, uh, James Lockhart, came in. This is a revelation for me. Um, I, uh, James Lockhart began to propose many years ago that there's a division in this, in this concept of Aztec, that the empire builders of the Western Nahuas and the city-state uh, uh, confederacy people are the Eastern Nahuas. And in fact, that made a lot more sense to us working in Oaxaca, because we're all intermarried with these Eastern Nahuas, and these are the people that were uh, constantly having these uh, volatile relationships with the Aztec empire, as you saw in uh, Franny's talk. So I came up with this construction of intermarriage as one of the primary movers, not imperial warfare, but marriage alliance. And uh, this has since uh, become quite uh, quite a popular topic now in Mesoamerican studies. So this is why the Mishtek Codices focus on these marriages. 
Um, and also, though, a marriage doesn't just simply join um, royal houses together. It also promotes monopolies. So a lot of the production of what we see in Codex Mendoza wasn't intended as a monetary system that simply rotates around in a, mar in a, in a market. It was originally created as elite wealth forms that are closely connected to mutual bonds, almost kind of compadrazgo between different family units across space uh, in these, these confederacies that I was recreating from the marriages. So that uh, they're an extension of even the, the uh, uh, accounting for all of these lineages. Now, um, Patty, a long time ago, pointed out in her original book, uh, Clothing Before Cortez, that the Mishtecs don't go to war in jaguar suits. Uh, in Codex Nuttall, they're all shown wearing them as court dress, courtly dress, as in the pre-Columbian context. Um, the Aztecs are the ones that actually put all these warrior suits on. And uh, it was just only about 10 years ago I had this revelation. This makes perfect sense. And I read an account in Duran about Tlaqueelel, where Tlaqueelel was, uh, they were confronting a Mishtec army, and Tlaqueelel turned to the Aztec troops and said, there's your marketplace, go get them. And uh, it's, this is exactly what Susan was talking about. The Aztecs are all coming home laden with all of this, this jewelry and everything. Well, in the Mishtec context, this is all stuff that represents uh, mutual uh, exchanges and bonds and reciprocal relationships to the Aztec. It is pure wealth. It's, it's, it is part of the underpinnings of a marketplace Aztec wealth system. Now, uh, finally, I wanted to, I began to think more and more about uh, 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 this uh, whole concept of human sacrifice, and which is actually called uh, national theory, uh, uh, debt pain and this uh, concept of the Temple of Maior and ripping out all these hearts and things. And I began to focus on this other concept of, well, what, what, what's actually the result of this? The fact of the matter is, is that um, there is a whole ritualized system here. The captor officially presents the captive to the entire gathering of the city of, the, of Tenochtitlan, including the emperor, and uh, addresses the uh, captive as, or the captive is addressed as the son and the captor is the father and the sacrifice is performed. And then, one of these warrior outfits that you see, according to the rank, according to all the captives that they were able to make, is awarded in front of this individual's family from the hand of the emperor himself. So a lot of this, uh, this is what uh, motivated them. This is what's illustrated in the scene from Salakun. So this wealth that we see in Codex Mendoza is purposely meant to be officially, it has to return to Tenochtitlan. And it is officially connected to ceremonies in which these warriors are publicly rewarded. Um, and it's this reward system that drives uh, the motivations of much of the Aztec army. Um, now this brings us then to these stones. Uh, one of the things I explored in the Aztec pantheon, the art of empire, was the contrast between the use of art in uh, Aztec society versus the use of art in uh, a Roman imperial society. But I think many of the motivations are still there. The Romans were faced with the same issues. Uh, they constantly had emperors like Caligula who went out and claimed they had conquered all of Gaul, but actually they were camped outside of town for two weeks and then just simply came back and sponsored a triumph for themselves. So um, these, are, these are all issues that all of these empires have to face. They have to demonstrate to their constituents that what they say they're doing in terms of bringing wealth into the empire they are actually able to produce or perform. So these stones, these gladiatorial stones, they were known as a temalakat, uh, such as the stone of Tiza, were extremely important to these productions, the, the, the theater of state. Uh, this one was dedicated to Tiza, and I think it's very important that Tiza is beginning to portray himself in this nature as we see I mean, he's wearing the hummingbird headdress, um, this is the kind of strategy that we see the early Roman emperors, particularly Augustus, beginning to have to wrestle with, is how to begin to insert himself in a reinsert or reassert the idea of the identity of the emperor as a divinity. And this is precisely what I think is beginning to subtly build its way back into uh, Aztec society, is this uh, co-opting of the divinity uh, by these emperors at the same time that they're sponsoring the use of these stones for these award ceremonies. Um, here's the stone that was later found uh, that has the name of Montecuzoma the first on it. So we know these stones were used in these gladiatorial combats, uh, particularly for elite captives. 
And uh, one of the issues that comes up then, I mean, is, is, is that these must have been fantastic things to see. I mean, uh, this is just the kind of thing that we, the thrill of the excitement of warfare that we get from watching uh, Russell Crowe rise from, you know, a uh, defeated general to all the way to the point where he's, he's redeeming himself as a gladiator in the arena. Um, that it must have been fantastic to see a celebrated warrior fight for his life while attached to this stone. Well, we have a lot of the same kinds of, this is a pre-industrial society, um, we have television. What are, we have, we're supposed to have these embedded reporters, they, they kind of evaporated, but what our government tells us we're supposed to do is kind of purposely uh, controlled for us or enacted for us through news media or lack thereof uh, in order to encourage our investment in these, uh, in these events with the promise that we will reap the rewards of these kinds of military adventures. So it's a very kind of controlled uh, form of media, distance media. So we no longer have these kinds of pageants. But for the Aztec, of course, this is an essential part of maintaining the investment of the people of Tenochtitlan in the military operations of the state. So uh, I just want to conclude by saying that that was that that was that is the long-term kind of mutual love affair that uh, Patty and I had in our re our work respectively. Um, but it went on. It, um, Patty, uh, I, I got to be better and better in artwork. Patty recruited me to help her uh, develop maps and, and illustrations for the worldwide history of dress, which is now in, Patty is in 17 languages, 17 translations, nine translations, and they were, they're outside. Yeah, okay, it's nine. Sorry, I thought I got 17. And then uh, most recently, uh, is her new book that will, is just coming out now from Townsend Hudson. It's called uh, Shamanic Regalia in the Far North. And uh, this is also something that fascinates me a good deal as well. So uh, maybe Patty, would, would you like to tell us a little bit about Shamanic uh, Regalia in the Far North? Okay. Well, I'm all done. that I, like a lot of the people who have been talking to you, 
I was born with strong historical instincts, and every single person who's spoken yesterday and today is the same way. We're drawn to history. I remember as a child, I thought that heaven would be that I would be allowed to live for short periods of time in whatever place and time or space I wanted, so that I could experience this whole realm of human history. Well, it didn't take long for me to realize I would probably never be able, you know, offered that option. But I figured out the next best thing would be anthropology. So as soon as my two youngest children were in school all day, fortunately I lived close enough to UCLA that I, and I was fairly cheap to go there in those days, I went to UCLA and I became an anthropologist. And then the question is, what was I going to study? Oh, while I was going to school, I realized, I learned, there was something called an acculturation study, where you figured out what you wanted to study. You could study roof tiles or pots, or I wanted to study clothing. But what you had to do was establish, first of all, a baseline before you could move through time. And that's what uh, Mesoamerican Costumes from the Codices is. That was my dissertation, and that was my baseline. So then I started out, and I started going the field. That's when I got friends stuck in the middle of the Rio Pantepe. I went into the field, I think, five times, and National Geographic funded me every single time. And I wrote that material up, and then I was very fortunate. I was asked by a wonderful publishing house in London called Thames and Hudson, and they asked me to write about ethnographic clothing all over the world. And I did. I wrote about 32 different areas of the world. And I was very fortunate. I've been to all but two, I think. I've never been to Korea, and I've never been to Patagonia. Aside from that, I've pretty well seen it all. Well, not all. I've seen bits of it. <laughs> but I've been lucky. I have been very fortunate to do that. And then I was able to write the, the Worldwide History of Dress, which indeed is already in English, French, German, Italian, Portuguese, Spanish, Japanese, Korean, and this year it will come out in Arabic. And next year, if Putin behaves himself, maybe in Russia. It'll be ten, ten different languages, and that pleases me very much. And then, I felt I had one more book in me. And where would I like to go? I, I chose it very carefully, very scientifically. I thought, first of all, where would I like to go? <laughs> and I didn't want, I wanted to go somewhere where they spoke English. I'm not a good, I'm not very good at foreign languages. And I thought, I want to go someplace cool. I've been very hot when I've worked in Mexico. And so I decided I would go to Alaska and the northwest coast. And that's what the far north. It's also Siberia, but that's only 55 miles across the Bering Straits. And it was wonderful. I went up the Kuchquim River to Bethel. I've been to Nome. I've been, I've been the northwest coast. It was absolutely marvelous. I've been very fortunate, and the book is out. It seems to be doing well. And here I am, being honored by all of you. And I want you to know how much I appreciate that, and my voice is about to give up. But I want you to know that I sincerely, sincerely thank you all. Mm -hmm.